Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher. Hello and welcome to The Spectator's Book Club podcast. I'm Sam Leith, the literary editor of The Spectator, and this week my guest is Sam Harris, philosopher, neuroscientist, and now, with great eminence, podcaster. And his new book, based on his Making Sense podcast, is called Making Sense, Conversations on Consciousness, Morality, and the Future of Humanity, with, and it's got a list of some of his guests, Nick Bostrom, David Chalmers, David Deutsch, Danny Kahneman, David Krakauer, Glyn C. Lowry, Thomas Metzinger, Robert Sapolsky, Anil Seth, Timothy Snyder, and Max Tegmark. A sort of omnium gatherum of serious thinkers on serious subjects. Sam, you write in your introduction that ten years ago you'd have been very surprised if someone had told you that now you'd be spending most of your time recording a podcast. Yeah, you know, I really just feel like a a very lucky beneficiary of changes in technology, both for my podcast and uh, also for my meditation app. You know, you know, but for the existence of podcasts and the existence of apps, you know, I'm I, I'm sure I would I would be writing and I'd be writing more. But there are obvious advantages to podcasting, and it's a very different way of spending time. So it's you know, on the whole. It's uh, you know I, I miss writing to, to some degree. I mean I still do it, but I you know find it harder to do just because it it really does represent an opportunity cost now. I mean the the, the stark fact is that I reach more people with my podcast in forty eight hours than I reach in a decade with all of my books combined. To sit down and spend a year writing a book has to be a good reason for it at this point, and I, I think I can still come up with those reasons, but. It's harder and harder, and it's it's just much more natural to turn on the microphone and have conversations with smart people and reach a comparatively much larger audience. There is a view that people have taken historically that you learn what you think by writing about it. Does the same apply to talking about it? Can you achieve the same clarity when you're speaking spontaneously? Not as much. That is one of the reasons why I keep writing and and why I don't think I could ever entirely stop. And the truth is I do some writing for my podcast, preparing notes for certain conversations. And some of my episodes have been effectively audio essays where I, I really have had a script. It's pretty close to producing an audio book. I mean, that, that's not the majority of my podcasts aren't that. Most of them are conversations at this point, but some of them have been. So I haven't totally lost touch with writing, and I think that's true. And the the reason to write, even if it presents a kind of opportunity cost at this point, is because that is the practice that allows you to really refine your arguments and to get what you think as clear as possible. And that's that really is what, to some degree, motivated this recent book, which is based on these podcast conversations and therefore based on the transcripts, but it gave me and my guests an opportunity to revisit the conversations and in writing our respective sides of, of each episode. So it is, is it really represents the, the final word on each of those conversations. And, and um, it gives you an opportunity to take your foot out of your mouth or, or take the other person's foot out of there. And there's certainly the greatest possible clarity when you finally go through the, the work of, of writing. Were you surprised by some of the edits? I mean, did you find yourself going, I, I, hang on, if you had actually said that, I'd have wanted to say this. I mean, I'm wondering how much unraveling the jumper. Obviously, we needed some ground rules so that the logic of the conversation wouldn't get distorted. And so the basic admonishment was, you know, don't do anything to your side of it that will force the other to say something else. You can refine your side of it if you are taking something out that the other was responding to, well, then that has to be adjudicated. But there wasn't too much of that. I mean, you, everyone was was fairly circumspect in the edits they made. But it's just you're just clarifying phrases and and adding some references and footnotes and just sharpening things up. What made you choose the interviewees you did to go into the book? Is there a common thread? 
it did constellate around a few core topics like the, the nature of mind, the nature of consciousness, and some of the concerns around existential risk, you know, AI being one. So there, there are a few outlier conversations, but most of them are on the nature of mind, the, the nature of morality. And that sort of fell out of my just looking at the the podcast that I thought really went deepest in terms of the uh, exploring these topics. And, and so this, I think it's 11 different contributors across 13 episodes of the podcast. And have you found your way towards these preoccupations? I mean, did you sort of start your podcast knowing this was what you were going to be talking about? Or is it an emergent property of your conversations? Well, you know, the podcast is has really become a kind of a sandbox in which I can explore anything that interests me. And it does, you know, on any given week, it might simply be the result of my deciding what I feel like reading next. You know, I just discovered that, well, I can, whatever I feel like reading, the podcast gives me a venue in which to speak with the author. And so there, there, it's often derivative of my reading interests and therefore many, even most episodes are based on somebody's book. But, you know, often it's born of some of my, my longest standing interests, which are in the nature of mind and, and questions about how our, our changing scientific understanding of ourselves can and, and should and ultimately must change our sense of how we should live. And so the, it's the intersection of philosophy and the philosophy of mind and, and the sciences of mind, neuroscience, and conceptions of morality and politics, public policy, all of the, the, the frontier between all of those seemingly disparate concerns, I think you, you can focus on it through questions like, you know, what does it mean to live a good life? What is worth wanting in this world? What's possible at the level of human experience? And, uh, you know, what are we missing? What are we likely uh, wrong about with respect to what we value? You know, notions of good and evil, how do we think of that in, in light of 21st century science? Those are my main concerns. Now, you yourself have this, which I'm, I'm very interested in, this kind of twin track of academic specialisms, which on the face of it, might seem to pull in opposite directions. I mean, you're, you're a philosopher, you're interested, therefore, I, I would say, ostensibly at least, in the idea that there is a sort of disinterested rationality that can get at truth. But as a neuroscientist, every, and one of your conversations is with Danny Kahneman, everything we've learned about cognition in the last few decades seems to suggest that rationality is a lot shakier than we think it is. Do these two pull in opposite directions, or am I, am I misunderstanding? It's one thing to say that reality exists and one can be right or wrong about it, which is to say one is a realist with respect to one's epistemology. You know, one thinks that there are facts of the matter, whether or not anyone understands them. Uh, we live in a world where everyone could be wrong. You know, we could have a false consensus about what's true. And so that posits a reality that is really out there, which we can struggle to understand. But the, the point you raise is that there we show every sign of being imperfect at doing that, right? There's no, you know, if you just look at it through the, the logic of evolution, there's no reason to think that we as social primates have evolved to understand reality perfectly. And so the, the, the degree that we have some purchase on it, it's really, uh, you know, fairly startling, just what we're able to do and, and apparently understand based on the fact that there's no way evolution has given us the tools that would optimize us for this project. Yeah, I think we have every reason to be skeptical that we'll ever come to a final understanding of the way the world is, but I don't think we should be skeptical about whether there is a there there, whether one's beliefs about reality can be more or less in register with it, or that one can be wrong or less wrong about in one's sense of the map and how it fits the territory. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a realist with respect to my sense of what's out there and, and how we should think about what we know and what we don't yet know. But 
yeah, I'm skeptical that we'll ever have a perfect understanding of anything in hand. One of the accounts of what's been called, you know, in a lazy way that you might take issue with, the post-truth era, is that radical epistemological skepticism, the sort of anti-foundationalist French philosophers, have somehow trickled through into the mainstream, and Baudrillard is responsible for our current political fix. Do you think there's anything in that? Yeah, I think there's something to that. I think the academy has been, with the exception of certain uh, subjects in the STEM field, the hard sciences, has been fairly vitiated by some terrible philosophy. You know, the idea that, as you say, there is no real foundation or, or, or no process of error correction that is objective or that stands free of cultural bias or in the current climate, we're even hearing allegations that the very notion of objectivity is is racist or a sign of, you know, you know white supremacy. Or I don't know if that, if that insane meme has made it to the UK, but that's what's happening in the US right now. In fact, the, the Smithsonian Institute just said something with respect to that, you know, that ob- objectivity and notions of, you know, academic rigor are just part of a poisonous legacy of, of white racism. This is quite properly insane to believe. Just look at our current circumstance. Virtually all of humanity is in various stages of lockdown uh, with respect to a pandemic, which we at this point understand to some degree with the tools of science, right? You know, within a few weeks of our learning about the novel coronavirus, we had published a genome sequence of it. We, We know something about what all that means and how to respond to it. And now we have laboratories all over the world struggling to produce a vaccine. All of this will succeed or fail based on how well we understand the biology of viruses. And the idea that all of this is just made up or that any standard of objectivity here is um, just uh, the imposition of dead white males on epistemology that should be um, continually seen through the lens of class and race and gender. And I mean, all of this is madness, right? I mean, irredeemable madness. Uh, It's not to say that race and gender and class don't bend people's thinking. I mean, obviously, they, it, they do, but that's why we have words like bias and wishful thinking and self-deception. And I mean, so th- these are these are the antithesis of what we strive for in science, which is to have a, a conversation about terrestrial reality that converges on something other than fiction, something other than a false consensus, and it becomes the kind of thing that is is the useful basis for you know, illuminating corners of the world that we have not yet uh, understood at all right that makes predictions about you know what would need to be true if what we currently think we have in hand is is in fact as we understand it to be so much of what is happening in universities at the moment is divorced from the you know, basic standards of empirical science and, and, and frankly, basic human sanity, right? I, mean, the, the, well, I think slightly back to Alan Sokol's social text hoax, right. which felt like it sort of <laughs> saw all this coming. Oh, yeah, that was fantastic. And, and you, as you probably know, there have been recent hoaxes of that sort making the same point, uh, you know, some of which uh, Sokol endorsed. James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose famously performed various uh, gender studies, uh, you know, and what they now term as grievance studies, hoaxes by by sending, I think it was as many as a dozen fake papers to a bunch of journals, and uh, they got published uh, or or achieved some level of acceptance before the, the hoax was unveiled. And, you know, that blow should land because there, there actually are no critical standards, really, what, 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 in, in some of those fields. What you're dealing with is just a perfect, a hermetically sealed discourse of uh, whose very foundation is confirmation bias and cherry picking and all of the tools you would need to, to reliably deceive yourself. To some extent, you know, one of the points that I think the Sokol and subsequent hoaxes have made is that, you know, if you find somebody who's got as a modish academic discourse, 
you can persuade them that it applies to a discipline that isn't their own, if you see what I mean. You know, so-called right. found in social text, a, a magazine that wanted to to believe that the discourse of social constructivism could apply to physics. Do you see there as being useful boundaries to be drawn? Because some of the conversations in this book talk about the idea of universality of knowledge or a sort of unity of knowledge between, say, the hard sciences and the social sciences that, you know, we can say, actually, here is an area in which these conversations about power and framing are up for grabs. And there are areas of science and knowledge, areas of knowledge, you know, maybe sort of areas of quite hard philosophy that actually, you know, this just doesn't apply. It's a category error. Well, I think there are different ways of speaking, you know, in different disciplines. And I'm not suggesting that all of those ways could or, or should collapse upon, you know, the, you know, what are arguably the more fundamental disciplines, right? So I, I'm not suggesting that all conversations ultimately sh- are reducible to conversations within as they, as they happen within the domain of physics. Though there'll be no time in the future where we're only talking about fields and forces and the properties of particles and and you know systems on that level. It just it's just not you can't talk about economies that way. You can't talk about most of what interests us that way. But the truth is there's no conflict between these different levels, right? So it's not while I w- wouldn't argue for a a true reductionism of concepts, you should be able to tra- traverse those boundaries between fields without discovering that you you simply can't believe uh, on one level what you believed to be true on another. There should be nothing about physics or biology or or chemistry or you know, psychology or or neuroscience which vitiates what I believe about the nature of my own mind, you know, as understood through, you know, the philosophy of mind or through, you know, a a more, you know, psychodynamic way of talking about my experience that doesn't directly reference neurotransmitters. Whatever we, we learn about neurotransmitters, while it must proceed in a different style of speaking, Right. I mean, so you know, let's say we're talking about the experience of love, right? Well, so I'm not saying that we should reduce all of our talk about love to talk about you know, dopamine and and you know various centers in the brain, but whatever we learn about the brain should ultimately be compatible with what we believe to be true about love as we experience it, right? So these these two levels of conversation proceed, but they're not they're not in contrast to each other. Is that a hope or is that an axiom? Well, I think it's an axiom. I mean, if in fact the unity of knowledge framing is true, I just don't see how it could be anything other than the case because the truth is the boundaries between disciplines don't truly exist, right? I mean, that what we're talking about are just there. We have various conventions which which dictate the way we frame concepts that are born of you know, fairly superficial things. I mean, they're, they're, they're literally born of things like university architecture and budgets. You could argue that there are boundaries between categories of knowledge, couldn't you? Well, no, but again, the, the, these are imposed for reasons that don't say anything about reality as it is, right? It's, it's not like, you know, nature has these partitions and the way we talk about uh, these different t- topics has been dictated purely by the, the feedback from nature. I mean, it's more the result of, you know, our developing certain tools, right? You know, you, you develop a microscope, you develop a telescope, and, and, you, and you point them in the, in the relevant direction. And then you're talking about, you know, the very, very small or the very, very large or the very far away. And, and different disciplines grow in response to these, these tools. But it's not that there really is a boundary between, I mean, there, there just is no boundary between specific disciplines in science. I mean, say, you know, neuroscience and chemistry. Well, you know, to the brain on, on the level of chemistry, the brain is a, is a bag of chemicals, right? So it's just it's like you, they're just, they're appropriate levels with which to frame concepts so as to, to say something useful. But 
as you, as you traverse these boundaries, you shouldn't be blindsided by your understanding of not working. I mean, so, I mean, just to take one example, if, if we're talking about the level of conscious experience, what we what we experience ourselves to be moment to moment, you know, the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling part of our lives, which is to say, you know, the, you know everything phenomenologically that we can point to as being what we are in the world. There's that. And then there's everything else we have reason to believe is going on outside of that, you know, illuminated space of consciousness. So I, I know based on what we've learned, you know, over the course of 150 years or so of, of studying the brain, that most of what the brain is doing, I'm not aware of directly, right? But if we, if we think some part of the brain is responsible for some part of conscious experience or must, by, by, by virtue of the way it's connected to other parts of the brain, be able to show up in conscious experience or constrain conscious experience, uh, well, then those experiments should uh, run as expected. Otherwise, there's something wrong about you know what we think is true at the level of the brain. So, I mean, the, the, the simplest possible version of this is I don't know when this happened, but it was, you know, it, was, it was many, many decades ago. Someone realized, just studying the anatomy of the, of the retina, that there had to be a blind spot in the in an optic blind spot in the visual field because the optic nerve passes directly through the retina on its way to the brain, and it's just there's part of the visual field that has no photoreceptors uh, covering it, right? So we should be able to see this, right? And and so based on a prediction uh, born of a, of studying the anatomy, a v, the very simple exper- experiment that most of us learned in in you know high school or or uh, sometime before of you know marking a piece of paper with with you know two uh, a fixation cross and a dot and closing one eye and moving it closer and further away until the second mark disappears, that exposes the optic blind spot. Now, if that had proved impossible, if you one could not find simply could not find a blind spot, that would require an explanation that has to somehow get married to the details of you know nerve tracts and and neuroanatomy. And if we if we couldn't do that, right? Well, then you know then the, the, yeah the, the, then we would have discovered some radical disjunction between our experience of the world and what we what we believe to be true. Uh, you know of the world itself, and that would be you know that would be you know a goad to to further skepticism. But we're not there, right? And we, we we continually find that you know, the the, 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 the these separate disciplines relate in some intelligible way. Uh, and where we don't, we're we're not satisfied with the explanations we have in hand. I mean, that's there's been a crisis in physics for most of our lives, or you know, for the, you know, the lifetime of anyone listening to this between just how to understand quantum mechanics and, and relativity, you know, because they're just, they aren't reconciled, and, but nobody's satisfied with that. Now, one of the, the things that seems to shine out of your podcast as a, as a way of going about things is that, you know, it's a civilized conversation, it's at length, and it's conducted in kind of what, what appears to be rigorous good faith. I mean, do you think that's why it's become so popular in the present Age. I mean, were you surprised by the idea that in what we've told is a very accelerated culture, where shouting at each other is is the way we communicate, that there was a, there was an appetite for this? Not really. I it's I, I think it's something that people more and more really thirst for, just having honest conversation that is not encumbered by the the usual conven- conventions of broadcast media i mean the absurd time limits where, where you you see on cnn for instance where they're they're attempting to talk about something of civilizational importance and you see you know some world expert on whatever it is climate change or the the you know threat of war between the us and china or you know whatever the moment is that needs to be talked about you see such a person given six minutes to say something of value before they cut to a commercial. Uh, it's it's just an insane way to try to make sense of of what's going on in the world. And and people, 
have become increasingly sensitized to that. It's just that there's something, especially when you're looking at, at when you're talking about controversial issues, where people have, um, you know, where where it has more the character of a debate, right? Well, then people come to these, the the usual uh, formats with, you know, their their canned talking points, and you know they're just desperately trying to get out some, you know, pre prepared paragraphs, which, you know, you, you know, under threat of interruption, and there's no possibility of, of good faith dialogue, right? There's the, the idea that anyone's mind is going to change by virtue of what happens in that conversation is, I mean, that's just, there's not even the pretense that that's possible, right? So it's, it's a, it's not, in truth, it's not actually a dialogue. You're asked to witness parallel monologues or serial monologues uh, so people are, I think, right to be dissatisfied with that, and and the, the you know podcasting is on some level it's it's exactly like radio. I mean, it's essentially radio on demand, but it it's di- it's different in at least two crucial respects. One is that you know most podcasts. I mean, some some function differently. I, I don't know how yours uh, functions. I don't know if you have if, if you impose a strict time limit on yourself, but. You know, many podcasts, certainly mine, don't have any notion of a of how long a podcast should last, right? So some of my podcasts are an hour, you know, or you know, or some are. I think the longest has been close to four hours, right? And it's it's entirely dictated by just the dynamics of the conversation and and the needs of the moment. And so not having the the burden of a ticking clock or a or a Production a schedule that you have to slot into really does change things, even when the final conversation winds up being more or less just as long as a radio conversation would have been, right? So, if it, so like a, it, knowing that you only have an hour is different than just having a conversation that that only lasts an hour, and it's it's different all the way through. I mean, literally every moment is different in my experience, as both as a host and as a as a participant, because it because when you have no time limit, being interrupted is not a threat to you ultimately saying what you need to say. So you you have the freedom to digress and let the other person digress. You have the freedom to to let the other person attribute views to you that you don't hold because you know that you have the time to, to clean up the mess. But the conversation can breathe in a way that it, it never can in normal formats on television and and even on ra- even long form radio so it's unusual in that respect i think people appreciate the difference the the, the other big difference for certain podcasts I mean, my own in particular is that the business model is different and podcasts are are far less vulnerable to the the pressures you know many legacy media uh, outlets feel to um, you know public changes in public sentiment, right? So the idea that you're going to come under pressure and and get canceled for something you said or speculated about or or didn't make clear or is far less fraught. It's not to say that you you can't you know stir up controversy inadvertently or otherwise, but it's it's a far better defended medium in terms of being able to to think out loud without. Having to be um, worried that you know you're you're going to pay a, a an unrecoverable penalty for it. You, you mentioned cancellation. Do you think the idea of cancel culture is a useful one? Yeah, I think it's an, an essential one at the moment. I mean, there are people who will say that it doesn't exist, but if you're paying attention, you can see it everywhere. I mean, it's just you know, I mean, just take the case of J.K. Rowling of late, right? So J.K. Rowling. Uh, said a, a few things on Twitter, which um, were construed, I think, you know, quite dishonestly as expressing some animus against the the transgender community. What she was actually, what she actually seemed to be doing, is just demanding that we acknowledge that biological sex is real. There is a difference between being born a woman and being born a man and then changing your gender uh, with, you know, surgery and and hormones and however fully you complete that process, the terminus of that process is not precisely the same thing 
as having been born a woman, you know, with a uterus and with ovaries and with the full, you know, experience of, you know, having two X chromosomes. You know, if we can't admit that, we have lost our minds, right? That is just true. Anywhere you stand, that is true, and that is being denied by a cult of uh, activists, right? It's not even being denied by most transgender people, I would assume, at this point, but it is being de denied by a very vocal and very aggressive cult. So you see what happened to J.K. Rowling, or what was attempted in her case, and it was it was energetic enough such that the, the stars of the films based on her books, I mean, people who owe their acting careers to her creative output, largely, to, I think, to a person, I mean, the, when you're talking about the primary actors, denounced her, right? They, they uh, you know, presumably felt that they were under enough professional pressure that that was the wise move for them. And that is... Well, they may have sincerely believed that she was wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true of some of them, but I mean, you know, it's just, it was crazy enough behavior to my eye that it suggested that they also felt that, you know, they were highly incentivized to come to that conclusion. Uh, I'm not saying that it was necessarily insincere in every case, but but the reality is, is that if J.K. Rowling were not the most successful author on planet Earth at the moment, or, you know, among them, she would have been effectively canceled by this effort. I think there's no question that her publisher would have dropped her or that if she had a book in press, it would have been, you know, swiftly unpublished because of how much energy this, this effort uh, uh, achieved. And it's only because she's J.K. Rowling that she, she managed to weather this. That's an extraordinary fact, right? Because this is, a bit, again, maybe she said something that I'm unaware of, but what from what I saw, she simply was saying that, okay, guys, let's get a grip on ourselves. We know, you know, I have got, I've got no bias against transgender people. I completely support what you're up to, but let's not forget that we have a word for a person who menstruates and that word is a woman, right? She was just trying to get a grip on this policing of language that we're noticing now where, um, you know, she was responding to somebody's description of somebody's tortured effort not to use the word woman and therefore offend trans women in reference to people who menstruate. So just using using people who menstruate in this this awkward phrase. And I think as, as a writer, I, you know, obviously I understand her concerns there, but just, you know, again, we this is a, this is, this is the final trench where we fight for the basic meaning of words and a basic understanding of what's going on in the world. I mean, if, if you're if, if if you're now talking to people who think that any notion of objectivity is white supremacy, uh, and that there is no difference between people who were born men and born women, I mean, the truth is, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, talking about this issue is not something that you know, I plan to do, but it's just it's just interesting to point this out. It's even inconsistent within the paradigm being argued for from the trans side, right? So if there is no difference between men and women, what could it possibly mean to want to transition, right? How could you find yourself to be in the wrong body if there's no difference between bodies, right? It makes no sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, a reductio ad absurdum of their own uh, of the most important decision they've made in their lives, right? So people either have to have a good faith conversation about basic facts here. We're just going to be hurling accusations of, of evil at one another. And that's what, you know, J.K. Rowling, to, to my eye, came under fire of that kind of attitude. And it's, it is, you know, to call it cancel culture is not inappropriate because these people are trying to get people's careers and reputations and livelihoods absolutely nullified for all time. I mean, the people who are on the other side of this think that J.K. Rowling should never be published again. Yeah. Can I ask, because this is something that I'm curious about, and I imagine you've got a view on it. Why do you think that the issue of trans rights, which at least statistically affects a relatively small minority of the population, we don't know mm -hmm. how big it is, 
has become the sort of crux for this particular line of argument, if you like, between a kind of extreme radical social constructivist account of the world and, you know, what J.K. Rowling might see as the, you know, reality-based, if you like, or the, the kind of more objectivist, if that's the right word. Why is it this issue? Why has this become the point of, of this front line of that war between worldviews, do you think? You know, you know, I, I just don't know. I, you know on, on some level, it just could, there might not be a, an interesting reason. I mean, it sort of had to be something, right? Like so, something was going to be in first position here, but it's, it's not the only issue there. You know, obviously race is, is a big one. And as a matter of just happenstance, it could just have an especially energetic uh, population of activists who have, have just pushed this further than than any other similar group but yeah i i actually don't know i just I, and i'm not this is not an issue i i spend much time paying attention to or i mean, I mean literally this is the most i've ever spoken about it is, is in the last you know 15 minutes uh so it's it's not my issue but the case of jk rowling is is instructive and and worth and sobering and and worth paying attention to because again i i know how this works in publishing i know i i see the other authors having their careers harmed and even fully canceled under similar uh, assaults and there is just no question that jk rowling has only survived this because of how successful she's already been right if you have to make a billion dollars in order to have courage you know, and, and to be shored up against spurious attacks like this, that's a bad situation for everyone else because J.K. Rowling will be fine, but many, many people won't be fine. And, and so it is with academ uh, in academia. I mean, we have people just tried to cancel Steven Pinker, and, uh, you know, a very similar uh, effort and not focused on the, on the trans issue, but, uh, you know, similar issues coming out of, uh, you know, woke activism. You know, again, unsuccessful, but it could well have been successful with another academic who wasn't a a superstar. Rowling and Pinker are both were both signatories of this famous Harper's letter. And actually, before I telephoned you, I was going to, I had the impression that you had been as well, but you weren't. Was it something that was sort of put under your nose and you chose not to sign? Uh, no, no, I, I simply wasn't asked. Right. You know, right. I, I'm, I'm sure I would have signed. I mean, I think it. You know, there there are ways in which the the letter was not perfect, but no, I, I just I wasn't asked. And ironically, they thought they could escape the the controversy that found them if they if they curated the list of signatories as as carefully as possible, right? And and I, I think there's some people on that list that, that don't really survive that that scrutiny. But for mo for most of the people. They, they really tried to find people who you would never hear speaking the way I just spoke for the last 15 minutes about the, you know, the, the trans issue. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because even then, it's as if they've slightly sold the pass in the sense that if we're starting from the position that it's a disinterested conversation about an objective reality, the sort of, in rhetorical terms, the ethos side of it, the who's speaking, shouldn't be important. Well, exactly. Yeah. And and the truth is, I mean, that to some degree undercuts the very idea of a letter of this kind, right? Like, you know, if the point is right, if the argument is sound, it doesn't matter who has signed it, right? You're not helping a bad argument no matter how many signatories you have, and a good argument doesn't need them, right? So, that, so that's... And so I, I, I am somewhat skeptical about the wisdom or utility of of these kinds of of letters, uh, and so I, I I'm I'm never eager to sign them. I mean, I've signed a few uh, when they come my way, just because if, if I agree with the effort, you know, I, I want to support it in the way that that's being asked of me. But I genuinely, or I, 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 gen, I should say, I generally think that that um, you know, it's it's usually a um, an ineffectual thing to to do and you know it's it, this this got a lot of press and it got a lot of pushback and a lot of the pushback was o only proved the point of the the letter i mean there were people who were effectively canceled 
as a result of having signed the letter, right, <laughs> by people who claim that cancel culture doesn't exist. It was interesting in that in that sense, but I'm, ha- I'm sort of happy not to have signed it, but I, you know, I, I think I would have signed it, certainly, if, if I had been asked. One of the arguments around cancel culture and the sort of culture war trenches in which people fight is this one over free speech. Is there a case to be made that what we call cancel culture is a result, if you like, of more freedom of speech? I mean, some people would argue, look, for a long time, people with big platforms have said stuff that people at home have gone, I hate this. I hate this person. Newspaper columnists, you see, you'd get some people would write in, but mostly they just sit at home and, and quietly throw a copy of the newspaper in the fire. And that now we've got these new technologies, it allows those people to make their feelings felt, which is experienced by the recipients of those feelings as a form of intimidation. It's, it's one thing to think that somebody's wrong and to argue that case. It's another to not like somebody. I mean, think they're, think they're not only wrong, but they're committed to bad things, which they know are bad, right? So you like to think that somebody's, you know, actually a racist and uh, saying racist things because they're a racist. And therefore, you want to, you know, shine a light on that problem and you th- you think that the, the, you know exposing the, this person as a racist should matter, right? That's fine. I mean, I think we need that kind of criticism. And yet, what's new about this is that so many of these criticisms are in bad faith. They're dishonest. On some level, you you know this person who you're alleging is a racist isn't a racist. To use racism as as one you know arrow in the in the quiver here. You're doing it because you think you know that it's this kind of allegation sticks, right? You know this is harmful. You know this can get traction. You know that the New York Times or any other normal institution is sensitive to an allegation like this. And your goal is to just harm this person's reputation or actually destroy their career because you've weaponized your speech. Take the present case. You know, you and I just spoke about the trans controversy around J.K. Rowling, right? Now, you know, to my ear, I said absolutely nothing bigoted about the trans community, you know, because the truth is I'm I'm not bigoted. I'm not bigoted across the board, and I'm, I'm certainly not, I feel no animus toward people who identify as trans. And these people need, you know, all the political protections they want. And, you know, I, I, I view this situation as one where I would extend all the equality to that I extend to anyone else, to people in the trans community. And, you know, there are sort of boundary conditions and interesting debates to be had about, you know, bathrooms. And, and this is sort of the thing that, that J.K. Rowling stumbled into. But all of those conversations can be had in good faith in an effort to you know, safeguard the well-being of well-intentioned and well-behaved people in our society, right? So none of this is an expression of, of political animus toward that community. But I can guarantee you for what I said about J.K. Rowling and about you know, biological sex and basic human sanity, some number of people would love to see me harmed for it. Right now, that's where it becomes cancel culture. Right. So if I worked at a place that could be petitioned, you know, in response to what I said, uh, you know, here's I was deeply offended by Sam Harris's transphobic remarks on the Spectator podcast and a Twitter campaign could get started on that basis. Then my employer would have a decision to make. And everyone has now gotten wise to this, that people can put pressure on employers to fire people who have done nothing wrong and believe nothing offensive, really. And the problem is that has worked over and over again. I mean, the employers have just caved into the mob, largely on Twitter, right? People who don't even spend much time on Twitter are now sensitive to what happens on Twitter. And so it's, it's become an absolutely pernicious dynamic and it's leading to a level of self censorship among you know otherwise smart and well-intentioned people which is also sinister and leading nowhere worth going so i can't tell you 
how common the experience is of, of any public intellectual who ventures into this space and touches any of these you know difficult topics in public. The uniform experience is of receiving private emails, you know, by the dozens or by the hundreds from academics and journalists and conference organizers and celebrities and, you know, you know pe- prominent people in our society who are terrified to open their mouths on any of these topics, right? And it's just an amazing thing to witness. And the reality is, is that this is, is something analogous to what happened to Salman Rushdie you know, decades ago with the with the, the Ayatollah's fatwa, right? I mean, Salman Rushdie was just hung out to dry by largely by liberal, you know, society because he had transgressed a taboo that, you know, no one was thinking much about up until that moment. But once people saw what was happening to him, there was just an ocean of cowardice that in, enveloped him there. And what should have happened is the very next day there should have been 10,000 Salman Rushdies, right? So he should have had company with everyone standing by his side, protecting his freedom of speech and their own. And that solidarity would have nullified his problem, right? I mean, would, he would not have had to have gone into hiding for 10 years in response to that fatwa. And and we're witnessing a similar thing. It's not where fatwas are being you know, real fat, you know, Islamic fatwas are being issued, but but there's something analogous to that. Analogous to that, it's a quasi-religious hysteria that is targeting people, and many people are going under, and it's scary to watch. Yeah. To move slightly sideways, I mean, there are of course good arguments from principle for you know very very wide remit on free speech, but the sort of pragmatic argument has always been if speech is as free as is possible, consistent with, I guess, you know, injunctions against incitement to violence and so forth, good ideas will drive bad ideas out. Now, how much, as our media environment changes, do you feel that's something that has the status of a kind of absolute truth that you can state with confidence? And how much does it feel like an article of faith? Well, I I, I do worry that within any time frame, it may not, in fact, be true, right? So I, I think ultimately it is, is true or, or, or effectively true that good ideas win. But there, but there is a difference between, and we might distinguish the truth of an idea and the, the fitness of an idea, Right and you know fitness in a very much in a Darwinian sense you know the, the, the an idea a meme can survive competition with all its rivals and it is an unhappy fact about us that certain very bad ideas and and you know obviously false ones are seemingly very fit for competition with their rivals and and they they spread well they are readily believed or at least endorsed. And they're hard to eradicate. That's a sobering fact about human discourse. It is an article of faith on some level. I think it's ultimately very likely to be true, but the conversation has to continue long enough to to enforce that truth or or to or to make it possible for a sufficient number of collisions to happen such that that bad ideas, are exposed as bad, right, or or, or internally inconsistent, right, or uh, inconsistent with what we subsequently learn to be true about the world or about ourselves, right. So I, I just think, I mean, the the reason why good ideas or, or you know or you know factual statements have to be fitter in the end is because they, they you know, by definition, only they will survive repeated collisions with new facts and new arguments and, and new evidence as it comes in, right? I mean, that, you know, that's, that's what it is to, to error correct, right? So what we need, the reason why a, a, a fairly complete commitment to freedom of speech, however indelicate it makes sense, is conversation is the only tool we have to produce that error correction, Right, it's it's the only method we have to continually stress test our beliefs and see what survives. 
And this is this is why it doesn't matter who's who wrote the letter or who signed it in the end. It's like e- either these the argument is is true or false, and and it doesn't become false once you realize that you know a, a Nazi signed the letter. You, we we need to to be intellectually honest enough to recognize that there that there are bad people who occasionally say factually correct things, and there are good people who occasionally are are, are flagrant, flagrantly wrong about the, the the you know in their claims about the nature of the world. The, the, the propositional content of a statement is divorceable from who said it, or who believed it, or who was right about it, or who who uh, was mistaken, and and we just have to be able to make those distinctions. Otherwise, there's again, it's like it's it's not just culture and politics that depend on these distinctions. It's basic human sanity. Yeah. There's a very interesting discussion in, in one of these conversations, which surprised me, your response to it. It's a, it's a thought experiment, and you'll be able to tell me who, who came up with it, about an, an urn of invention, mm-hmm. whereby, you know, humankind is, forgive me if I misrepresented, is sort of randomly pulling these coloured balls out of the, this pot, and there are white ones, which are ideas or inventions that advance humanity in an uncomplicated way. Grey ones, which have both costs and benefits. And there is, what if somewhere in that urn, there's a black one, which, having been invented, can't be uninvented and essentially poses as an existential threat? I think, is that the right yeah. way of understanding it? Yeah, so yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, you, you light on that's from Nick Bostrom. Nick yeah. Bostrom, who's a, a philosopher at the University of Oxford and quite a um, a creative thinker. And yeah, so it's, it's a great analogy. And it, he he uses it to describe, you know, scientific inventions and, you know, and new technologies mostly, but it, it would apply to really any idea that can't be unthought or uninvented, right? You know, so so yeah, it's 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 quite pot we've been pulling white and gray balls out of this urn. And as you say, so you know, the gray balls are have a kind of dual character. They can be incredibly uh useful and and um and uh you know help us uh, do a variety of things. I mean a gray ball might be the internet. It might be you know our ability to uh produce nuclear power by splitting the atom but obviously there, there's a good and bad to these things but so nick is imagining that it's at least conceivable that there's a at least a, you know so, some number of black balls in the the urn of invention which which is to say that there are things that we could discover with, with the mere discovery of which it would be synonymous with human extinction in the end one example he gives is what if it just proved to be the case that you know initiating a nuclear chain reaction, so splitting the atom, you know, nuclear fission, once we discovered it, it was trivially easy to do. It required nothing more than you know taking two pieces of glass and a handful of sand and putting them together and you know you know sticking them in a microwave oven, say, right? I mean, just something that anyone could once they once we once the knowledge got out about how to do this. Any suicidal maniac could blow up a city with zero training, right? If we lived in that world where, uh, where, where that was was in fact the way things worked, well, then the game would be over, right? We would, you know, we, a hundred cities would have been already devastated by a nuclear blast because it, you just don't need that many crazy suicidal people. But it's the second stage that. of the thought experiment that I, I found so interesting, and you said you call it turnkey totalitarianism. You say, you know, it would be moral, indeed necessary, to put in place, effectively, some sort of totalitarian system to prevent this from happening. Yeah, so that, that again, that's uh, that doesn't originate with me. That's Nick's argument. And, again, just, just, just imagine what happened. What if we discover some property of matter such that you could initiate a city uh, annihilating explosion based on doing almost nothing, right? You know, just uh, literally, just you just need the information about how to do it, and you can walk into your kitchen and do it, right? If that's the way atoms behave, well, then in order to survive, I mean, the only political regime compatible with human survival in that case, very likely, is for some 
you know, fairly Orwellian strata of, of government to know what you're doing with your hands at all times. We can't leave you alone with your hands for more than 30 seconds because some number of people, given that freedom, would uh, destroy a whole city every day of the year, right, going forward. So Nick is not trying to celebrate the, uh, the prospects of totalitarianism. He's just saying it's possible that we live in a world where we could discover something so dangerous that it would force a complete change of political expectation and aspiration on us overnight because of just how dangerous this knowledge is and just how uncontainable it is. We could literally open Pandora's box and be faced with a, an emergency that would never go away, right? His underlying point here is that we practice science without any foresight that this is the situation we might be in, right? No one is constraining, no one, very few people are even thinking about constraining their inquiry into the way the world is by this possibility. So Nick is arguing, I mean, people who focus on existential risk as a problem are trying to build awareness around this principle that, yeah, yeah we just can't keep pulling ba balls out of the urn without any awareness of, of the, the prospect that, that certain types of knowledge might be suicidal. And so that, and I think that's a very interesting thing to, to argue for. And I think we know something about the, the possibilities here to be worried on certain fronts such that we, we should be moving very carefully, right? I think, you know, Nick and, and does I... Does it have practical ramifications? I mean, recognizing this. Yeah, well, I think it does. For instance, with, with AI safety, I think it's, you know, that conversation has been pushed, again, largely by Nick into a place where many serious people who are doing the work are, are taking these kinds of concerns seriously. We have, on some level, only one chance to get superhuman AI right. We're going to be in a, in, a, in a situation where we produce artificial intelligence that is beyond human in every relevant respect, which is to say more powerful than we are. We, we, we will, if we just keep making progress, and you know, the only reason to think we wouldn't is you know, some other civilizational catastrophe would befall us in, in the meantime. But if we avoid that and we just keep building more intelligent machines, at a certain point, they will be better than we are for everything we care about cognitively. And at that point, they will be better than we are at designing the next iteration of software and hardware. And to rule that out is to assume something, you know, I think at this point quite indefensible about the nature of intelligence and the nature of minds, right? So, I mean, you'd have to imagine that, that there's just some reason this is impossible in principle. We'll never develop superhuman minds in silico. And I just think that's just, there's just no reason to believe that. So if we just keep going, we will find ourselves on the cusp or, or over the cusp of, you know, a breakthrough in building intelligent machines and then suddenly be in relationship to something more powerful than ourselves that will have an independent point of view and whether it's conscious or not I, le I leave that aside you know it, it might in fact be a whole other conversation <laughs> yeah i mean that the lights the lights might not be on at all but the power of its intelligence will be indisputable and what we don't want at that point is to find ourselves in negotiation with something smarter than ourselves who may develop its own goals that we can't foresee and that we haven't tethered to our own aspirations effectively enough such that its autonomy is is now at odds with our own well-being right and, and and we don't again we don't want to be in a situation where we're saying okay could you stop doing that that's not you know that's not exactly what we were hoping for again we're now negotiating rather than in a position where we can simply turn something off right yeah. and nick more than anyone in in his book superintelligence he sketched out this terrain in 
broad strokes very effectively and very vividly. And it's it's a fantastic book. I recommend people read it. It's um, and it I mean it, I mean lest you think it's these are these problems are just by definition, you know, f- fanciful or or will be just we'll, we'll just be we'll just know how to solve them when they arrive. I think you're cured of that by getting into this literature. And Nick Nick's book is a is a great place to start. Is it conceivable to you, again, as a thought experiment, that a black ball could emerge, which isn't a sort of scientific invention, but which is an idea or a form of speech or some other sort of meme that would necessitate the same sort of totalitarian reaction for our own safety? I mean, do you see speech as a totally separate category from, if you like, technological invention? You'd have to spell out what the power of this idea would be. I mean, I think there's some spectacularly bad ideas out there that are very dangerous, right, that need to be criticized. And having unconstrained speech is, is you know, is your your cognitive and social immune system in action there. So, I mean, I think we need to to, to be able to criticize some of the you know the ideas that have come up even thus far in this conversation, you know, uh, ideas about race and gender, and I, mean, I think these are there's a kind of moral panic and you know even hysteria brewing here, which I, I think is socially very damaging and politically very dangerous. And I think it's you know it's the kind of thing that if left to do its mad work unchecked can produce its own spectrum of you know very damaging effects but could also produce a a, a very dangerous counter reaction right I, mean, I, I largely think of Don, you know the the presidency of Donald Trump at least in part as a reaction to what has been happening on the left and the influence of the far left on even very mainstream uh, institutions on you know on on academia and on on mainstream journalism and the the distrust of institutions the almost ubiquitous uh, d- distrust of institutions now is to a significant degree a measure of what the left has done to these institutions and i consider myself you know, you know very much a a liberal uh, on you know almost every point but the distinction between you know real liberalism and what has happened on the far left has become increasingly excruciating. The counter reaction to all of this is um, is something that I worry a lot about. And you know, as you probably know, I'm I consider myself as committed a critic of Donald Trump as as really anyone on earth. There's almost nothing to say. Uh, uh, critical of the man that is that proves an exaggeration, but you know that said, so much of the left's criticism of him also manages to be in bad faith, right? You know, so, so for instance, while I, I do not doubt that he's a racist, many of the allegations uh, against him, uh, alleging his ra- racism, are obviously absurd. The left is so badly calibrated in its attacks against the right. You know, finding Nazis everywhere, even where they can't possibly exist, that it's um, it's it's so unhelpful that I think it it energizes its 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 counter response. If we happen to live in a universe where you know, to my horror, we wind up with four more years of of Donald Trump, which I you know I consider you know something like an existential threat to at least to our democracy. I will largely blame the far left for that, right? And it's dishonesty and it's panic and it's absolutely bonkers calls to, you know, abolish the police, right, in the United States, right? Even in the highest crime parts of our cities, right? It's just, it's completely nuts. And it's the, exactly the th- kind of thing that could get Trump reelected. Again, he he may be too far gone given his inept response to the, the COVID pandemic. But if anything is going to get him reelected, it will be that kind of uh, craziness. And again, so to my eye, the left just seems to be doing everything it's, it can to get Trump reelected rather than doing the sane and prudent things to, that it could do to, to block his, his chances. I worry about both sides of the political spectrum here. 
But if you're talking about an idea that is so bad that the mere thinking of it could get us all to annihilate ourselves, it would have to be, again, I mean, for that to be true, it would have to be completely impervious to the pressures of criticism. And I just, I, you know, I think criticism is stronger than that. I can't see what the shape of that idea could possibly be. I mean, it's a little bit like alleging that there, it's, it's the Monty Python routine that, you know, there's a joke so funny that it, you know, the mere hearing of it proves lethal, right? So you just have to tell this joke you know, on the battlefield and watch it spread. You know, it's a little bit like that. I don't know. I don't, I, I can't imagine a joke quite that funny. We've taken a lot of your time already. Sam Harris, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher.